them to a webinar with the CASW. We are so excited to be joined by some incredible people today. Um, I am just going to do a very quick introduction before I pass it off to our incredible panelists. Thank you for coming from wherever you are, wherever you're at. This is going to be about an hour and a half long presentation, and we're so excited to have you. Um, before I get started, just a couple little housekeeping notes for everyone. Take a note that your platform is completely customizable. So you can make the panelists bigger, you can make the slides bigger, make sure your Q&A tab is open so that you can ask some really incredible questions of the presenters and really just play around with it to ensure that it's the best viewing uh, experience for you possible. Uh, if you have any questions of our presenters and you are joining this live event, please feel free to ask them at any time and throughout the presentation and we will be able to compile them for a formal Q&A. I want to acknowledge quickly that we are on, uh, the CSW is on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples. And we I am a guest here today. We are all guests here from wherever we are. And I'd love for you to take a moment and acknowledge the land that you're on as well. I am going to pass it on. Just note that I am behind the scenes today. So if you have any questions about the work that anyone is doing, and if you want to make sure that you have questions about the uh, the platform or anything like that, you can make sure you use that Q&A tab as well for that. Uh, we are joined by two incredible co-hosts today, uh, Senator Wanda Thomas Bernard and uh, our member of parliament, uh, Mahad Jahari. So we have a couple little fun things going on, but what I will do is pass it on to member of parliament, Mahad Jahari for a opening remarks. So please take it away. We're so happy to have you. Uh, uh, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us for this very important event in the honor of Emancipation Day. I'm honored to sit on this panel alongside knowledgeable leaders in this area, and you're going to see so many of them and hear for so many of them uh, who are experts and who've devoted their time and resources to advocating for better outcomes for Canadians of African and Caribbean descent and to resolve the generational impact that have affected these communities to this day. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Richmond Hill, Ontario, on the traditional land of Wyandot, Anishinaabe, Iroquois, and Métis people, whose presence on these lands continues to this day. I would like to thank them and other Indigenous communities for sharing these lands with us. I'm speaking to you as a member of parliament for Richmond Hill. The reason I'm here today is to speak on aspect of motion 36, which is the private member motion that I put forward to be debated in the House of Commons in past February. This motion calls on the support of my fellow members of the House of Commons to have the Parliament of Canada officially recognize Emancipation Day throughout our nation in every province and territory. Currently, Emancipation Day is observed in some provinces like Ontario, but this historic and symbolic day has yet to receive nationwide recognition despite it touching the lives of so many. It remains an important celebration, especially in the cities with historically significant black communities throughout Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and British Columbia. Motion 36 builds on extensive work carried out by the Honorable Senator Bernard with Bill S255 in the last parliament. As an ally learning about the cultural complexity of Canadian black history, Senator Bernard's guidance was essential to helping me navigate the subject with care, sensitivity, and nuance. My work on this motion to date has also been informed by community groups like the Ontario Black History Society and the expertise of colleagues like MP Greg Fergus and the members of the All Part Our Par Parliamentary Black Caucus. When I decided to take on this work, I connected to the subject matter due to my own experiences facing discrimination and racial profiling. Since moving to Canada, I've been lucky to live in a diverse and compassionate writing like Richmond Hill. But that's not to say that I haven't seen and experienced the effect of racism, ignorance, and discrimination in my own daily life. I came to Canada some 41 years ago from 
my birthplace and my home country, Iran. At that time, Iran was going to a um, cultural revolution and I chose to um, seek as an international student and continue my education in Canada. Uh, at the outset, I experienced um, racial and ethnic uh, discrimination because of the color of my hair, because of uh, the color of my skin, because of my ethnic background, and because I did not speak the language and um, uh, my accent was quite clear. So in that sense, I knew that I could empathize and relate to some of the struggles the Black and Indigenous people in the history and present day in Canada. While I've done my best to learn about Canada's history and culture, I was still surprised to uncover a rich, deep well of stories through research, correspondence, and discussion with community leaders and allies, some of you you see here today. Over time, through multiple discussion, it became clear that Canada's history involving Canadians of African and Caribbean descent has yet to be fully included and discussed in our schools, in our institutions, and most importantly, in our living rooms. That's what this motion seeks to change because slavery and segregation, which are two major struggles which had lasting impact on the well being of Black Canadians, are sadly treated as an American problem. But these are part of Canada's history as well, and to act otherwise is to deny the truth and invalidate the lived experience of so many Canadians. To recognize Emancipation Day means to confront that history, accept our mistakes, and commit to changing old patterns. Emancipation Day itself is an affirmation of freedom, equality, justice, and belonging. And that's what almost all the people from all over the world, when they immigrate to Canada, they seek. Originally, Emancipation Day was celebrated by Canadians of African and Caribbean descent as a way to publicly declare one loyalty, patronism, and gratitude for the legal abolition of uh, slavery in the British Empire. Over time, this day has become an opportunity for black communities to share and remember the stories and the struggle of their ancestors, many of whom were enslaved or fleeing enslavement. Black-led publications also historically used this time to circulate pamphlets promoting important political causes and discussing key issues. Emancipation Day is a way for everyone, Canadian of, a Canadian of African and Caribbean descent, as well as their allies, to recognize the invaluable contribution that the Black Canadians have made to our military, to our government, to our culture, and to every major part of Canadian society, as people who deserve the same right, freedom, and opportunities as everyone else enjoys. I believe that every person stands to gain from discussing Emancipation Day and the history that it represents. I also believe the Emancipation Day is a day that should be more widely known and celebrated across Canada, if not across the world. Motion 36 on Emancipation Day when passed, will have Parliament officially recognize the abolition of the slavery on August 1st, 1834 in the British Empire, including British North America or present-day Canada. The role of British colonies, including our nation, in perpetuating and participating in the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade prior to 1834. To acknowledge those abolitionists who struggled to defy the prevailing norm of their time and who laid the groundwork for the change. The historic underpinning of Emancipation Day. The many untold stories and unsung achievement of black Canadians in Canadian history. And finally, the need to address anti-black racism in the context of United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent. And for the purpose of achieving our goal, of a just, inclusive, and equal society. In a normal time, debate for this motion would have begun in May of this year, and we're hoping that it would conclude before August 1st. However, we are not in normal times. Unfortunately, our country is in the middle of a dealing with COVID-19 
a global pandemic health emergency that has claimed lives of over all over the world. Due to circumstances out of our control, this and other motions have been put on hold as we adjust to a new normal and a remote parliament. Over multiple meetings and calls, I push to have this motion debated. There seems to be a bit of a technical difficulty if we're just holding for a minute more to see if MP Jawari can rejoin us. Maybe we could start with the panel introductions. Yes, I think I'm gonna have to get him to reconnect. So Natasha, maybe you can take it away and we'll start with panel introductions and I'll see if we can bring him back online. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to keep the program moving um, and we'll allow MP Jawari to uh, finish up his comments when he's able to reconnect. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, when I am facilitating or participating in a conversation, I like to open with words from an elder. And today I am going to share a quick quote from John Lewis. John Lewis states that freedom is not a state, it is an act. It is not some enchanted garden perched on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is the continuous action we all must take and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair, more just society. And so those are the words of our now ancestor, John Lewis, who passed away during the past week. I would like to welcome you uh, once again to our panel, Freedom Delayed is Justice Denied. And I'm happy to be um, moderating this conversation with an amazing panel who I'm going to introduce to you today. It would appear our that the MP back. Um, so maybe we can have him just finish his uh, opening comments if you don't mind. Yes. You're a little bit, you're, I think you're muted, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, good to go. Good to go. My apology, uh, the internet and the technology is not helping me today. Um, <laughs> I'll close by saying, as for myself, I continue to advocate for a more inclusive, culturally aware and diverse society in which Emancipation Day and its history are represented and embodied in our school and our institution. Once again, I'm honored to be sitting on this panel alongside leaders on this topic, and I look forward to answering questions and hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, MP Jawari. 
Our first panel is the Honorable Jean Augustine. Miss Jean Augustine immigrated to Canada in 1960 and worked as a nanny, teacher, principal, and later chair of the Metro Toronto Housing Authority while raising two girls. In 1993, she became the first Black woman elected to Parliament, then Cabinet Minister and Deputy Speaker. She successfully championed uh, the Black His for Black History Month and five, famous five motions. Today, she serves via her Center for Young Women's Empowerment and through the York University's Jean Augustine Chair in Education, Community and Diaspora, and two schools honor her name and her work. Welcome, Honorable Jean Augustine. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Afua Cooper. Dr. Afua Cooper is a professor at Dalhousie University, the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology. She's a current uh, Halifax Poet Laureate. Uh, Afua is the author of the best-selling book, The Hanging of Angelique, The Untold Story of Slavery in Canada, and The Burning of Old Montreal, and has published five books of poetry. She is the founder of the Black Canadian Studies Association and is the chair of the scholarly panel on Lord Dalhousie's relationship to race and slavery. Welcome, Dr. Cooper. Uh, thanks, Natasha. Thanks to everyone. Next with us is Irene Moore Davis. Born and raised in Windsor, Irene Moore Davis is an educator, historian, author, and activist who frequently speaks about equity, diversity, and African Canadian history. She fulfills community roles, including president of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, is the chair of the annual Buxton National Historic Site History Conference, and the programming chair at Bookfest Windsor and is also co-host of the All Right in Sin City podcast. And her forthcoming book is titled Our Own Two Hands, A History of Black Lives in Windsor from the 1700s Forward. Good evening, Irene. Good evening. We next have Dr. Carolyn Smarts Frost, Dr. Smart Frost is an archaeologist, historian, and an award-winning author specializing in African-Canadian, African-American transnationalism. She's a visiting scholar at SUNY Buffalo and adjunct professor at Acadia and Dalhousie Universities. Carolyn's 1985 excavation of Canada's first underground railroad site made history. She spent more than 20 years researching the lives of freedom seekers Thornton and Lucy Blackburn. Her 2007 biography of the couple, I've Got a Home in Glory Land, A Lost Tale of the Underground Railroad, won the Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction. In her latest book, Steal Away Home, Carolyn tells the story of 15-year-old Cecilia Jane Reynolds and her remarkable flight to freedom via Niagara Falls. She is a Toronto native, but now divides her time between her Wolfdale home and a cottage overlooking Nova Scotia's beautiful Mahoney Falls. Welcome, Dr. Carolyn Swartz Frost. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. <laughs> And I am Natasha Henry. I'm the president of the Ontario Black History Society, educator, historian, and curriculum consultant, uh, and author of uh, two books on Emancipation Day. Um, and I'm happy to be with you this evening to facilitate and to um, be part of this wonderful conversation. Again, freedom delayed is justice denied. And so I'm going to delve right into our first question. Uh, we have a few questions that I'm going to um, ask panelists to respond to, um, a few panelists, and then we'll uh, decide and see how many um, panelists can respond to each of the questions. The first question, and I have the questions here on the screen, I hope everyone can see, is what did August 1st, 1834 mean for your ancestors, or how do you connect to the history of Emancipation Day? I wanted to take the time to first read the response of Blaine Courtney, who unfortunately could not be with us in the panel this evening, but uh, shared this response that he really wanted um, for us to, to read. 
So what does emancipation mean to me? When I was young and couldn't even spell emancipation, it was a time to gather with my black cousins and have a day of fun. As my spelling improved, I recognized and was amazed by the courage of my ancestors. Lastly, I realized that Emancipation Day was just the first tiny step in the struggle for equality in a journey which still has a long way to go. So we'd like to thank Blaine for his contribution to this response. Uh, and so before the panelists respond, I'm just gonna ask that when you're not speaking, if you could please mute um, just so that the individual who is speaking can be heard clearly without any background noise. And so I'd like to pose this question first to Irene. Unmute. Personally. Oh. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. August 1st, 1834 means so much to me personally and as a historian. I mean, for my family personally, on my father's side, I recognize that this is the moment uh, that, that really uh, made a, a change in the lives of my ancestors in the English-speaking Caribbean. On my mother's side of the family, I'm uh, well aware that for my ancestors who made it here from chattel slavery in the United States to freedom in Canada, and for free people of color, ancestors who made it here to Canada, it was such an important date. So I want to give uh, the most praise to the ancestors who crossed that bridge. It was a bridge that was built through legislation uh, by allies, but it took the initiative and the creativity and the courage of the Underground Railroad ancestors to make their way here to Canada and really seize that moment. And I'm so grateful to all of them. I mean, without August 1st, 1834, I would not be me and neither would be a whole lot of uh, people of African descent in my region of Canada, Southwestern Ontario. And I'm so grateful. As a historian, I recognize that it was such a critical moment um, for the history of Canada um, and throughout the British Empire really, but for the history of Canada specifically, it was the beginning of, of uh, a great uh, history and legacy of movement towards social justice, equity, and freedom. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but it was a very important uh, moment. And it's something that we should all honor even today. Thank you, Irene. Um, Thank you, Natasha. And I'm so very pleased to have the opportunity to sit around with um, some of the people that I see as Trojans in the in the spreading of um, of the history and uh, the acknowledgments that we all need to make uh, as we recognize uh, this history, the history of African Canadians, the history of uh, of Black folks in this part of the world. I was born and grew up in Grenada. Uh, and in the early years, I remember those celebrations around the Emancipation Day. Emancipation Day was celebrated always as the first Monday in August. And it was a public holiday. I think it still is a public holiday. And that was a day of um, lots of food and drink and going to the beach and talking about um, our African heritage. At the same time, there were undercurrents of the fact that as that act was uh, proclaimed in, 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 in the British Empire, that uh, with and in that act was the fact that the owners of slaves, the owners of those enslaved people were being paid for the fact that they were losing uh, their labor. And I think this is one thing we have not really dealt with as we talk about moving towards freedom, that those people who uh, in benefited uh, from the labor and from the um, and from the all of the residues of slavery, that those people were remunerated, and uh, the others were just um, the proclamation was just made and they were set free to be on their own. And of course, we know all the history and you have historians that can tell you about what has happened. Uh, I like the theme, freedom delayed is uh, justice denied, because I think it's a play on 
uh, on the, the legal maxim, uh, justice delayed is justice denied. And when we, we are in uh, the challenge in time that we are today, I think all of this justice delayed and, uh, and justice, um, justice denied, that freedom delayed is justice denied. I think that uh, we can see all the synchro, uh, we can see how all of these things come together, fit together. And why it's so important for us to have a session like this, to be talking about uh, Emancipation Day, to be asking the government of Canada to declare August 1 as a, a, a recognition throughout Canada, uh, that we need to recognize this day and what comes with it. It's the fact that we have not, um, as Canadians, we've not filled out our history in such a way that all these things are taught in our classrooms and are in our books and, and uh, in our social studies programs. And so we, when we make an announcement at the federal level that um, Emancipation Day, then that forces us and would force Canadians to begin to look at that history and that period of time and what has happened since that uh, and and can see where that freedom delayed is is really justice denied and that all that we are asking and all that we are asking corporate Canada that we're asking of uh, of government researchers institutions etc that we really um, trying to close that that uh, that denial of um, of justice as a result of lack of all the freedoms. It has been said that um, that people who wish uh, to expand freedom must be bold because uh, timidity does not bring about lasting meaningful change. If freedom is not being expanded, freedom contracts. And I think that if we look at the history over the years, we can see that con that contracting, that, that pulling back of so much that the word uh, freedom entails. And so when I look at uh, the experiences in the in the Caribbean setting, what we've been able to do, um, the celebrations, the fact that we make this a holiday and that everyone in the society recognizes what this is about and connect the present day Emancipation Day 2020 with emancipation with what has happened to our people over the many years since crossing the Atlantic. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Afua, if you could uh, chime in. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Greetings to the panel. Um, can you hear me, Natasha? Yes. Yes. Yes, okay. we can. All right. So what, thank you. So what does emancipation, um, what does it mean to me? I. I, I grew up in a post-independent Jamaica or post-independence Jamaica. And so on that first Monday in August, we celebrated and still do celebrate Independence Day. But my mother used to talk about Emancipation Day, what Black Jamaicans celebrated before August 1st, 1962 was Emancipation Day. And about since maybe 1990, um, with a clamor from activists, uh, the Jamaica and the rest of the British Caribbean started once again to celebrate Emancipation Day, August 1st, and also the independence um, dates that, that they have. So it's wonderful that Emancipation Day is back as a major, major holiday in the Caribbean. And so what that means to me is, is obviously freedom, the freedom that my ancestors struggled for and, um, and won, and migrating to Canada and eventually doing a PhD in African Canadian history on the abolitionist movement. Of course, the whole discussion about Emancipation Day um, loomed large in, in, in my work, as some of you know, my dissertation was on Henry Bibb, the founder of the Black Press in Canada, with his newspaper, The Voice of the Fugitive, which he also co-published with his wife, Mary Bibb. And in the pages of The Voice of the Fugitive, and, you know, 
as August 1st approach, there's uh, this discussion about what's happening in the community for uh, August 1st, for Emancipation Day, who is coming, which luminaries are being invited from Toronto, the bibs who are in Windsor, who are coming from Toronto, <clears throat> who are coming from Owen Sound, uh, people are coming from Buffalo, from New York, from Detroit, from everywhere. It, it was the major event. And here are these people who are um, African Americans by birth, but coming over to British soil and embracing August 1st as their emancipation day, looking upon Britain as, you know, being uh, the great emancipator because slavery was still existing in the United States. So Emancipation Day um, meant it was the biggest holiday perhaps in the black social and cultural calendar for much of the 19th century. And I think later on, we're gonna go and talk about the, the 20th century. Um, so, you know, all my experiences, all who, who I came to be, whether as a, a child being born and raised in Jamaica, coming to Canada, examining the black struggle, living the black struggle, Emancipation Day is like a, a, a major, major moment in my own life and the life of my community, Canadian community and the international community. And so I, I applaud all those who are taking the step to nationalize this holiday and perhaps even internationalize it. But at this moment, in 2020 and even before 2020, in the past couple of years, I've been thinking about what does Emancipation Day really uh, uh, mean? And so I go back to the act that was passed in the British Parliament on 28th August 1833. And of course, this is a, a, a summary of the act, a condensation. It says, and this was the act to abolish slavery. And I quote, an act for the abolition of slavery throughout the British colonies, for promoting the industry of the monumented slaves, and for compensating the persons hitherto entitled to the service of such slaves. And of course, this act took effect August 1st, 1834, in the British overseas colonies, mainly the British West Indies, um, South Africa, Mauritius, and um, and in Canada too, some enslaved Africans were emancipated by this act. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to, to two words, industry, for promoting the industry of the monumented slaves. So even though they were going to abolish slavery, the British, they had in the front of their minds, this was certainly not in the back of their minds, in the front of their minds was the idea that these and slaves or formerly enslaved um, were to be industrious. They were still to be working for the white masters. And the other um, word or fr uh, phrase, compensating the persons hitherto entitled to the service of such slaves. So Dr. Augustine drew attention to this matter of compensation, but for the slave masters, and the enslaved people themselves, they were told, okay, you guys are free, go do your thing. With nothing, no support from the British government. Um, uh, basically nothing except this legal uh, act, this piece of paper. And so for me, the, the miracle of black life in, in modern times is that the enslaved and their formerly enslaved and their families were able to create societies, especially in the British Caribbean. The formerly enslaved, the newly freed people were the ones who created a modern society with little or no help from the British government. They got, they got no land. Every piece of land that they received, they pooled their pennies together and they bought but no compensation. The British government paid 20 million pounds to the former uh, masters and, and mistresses, 20 million pounds, which we know today is worth $7 billion. Not, not dollars, pounds, 7 billion pounds in today's money. And so think of that. 
So while this act ended slavery, it did not abolish racism and anti-black racism to be more specific because the newly freed people could not vote. They, could, um, they, they, they couldn't get certain jobs. They couldn't worship in certain places unless they were Anglicans. Um, there's a ho whole host of disabilities that were put in place um, as soon as that act was passed. So guess what happened? On August 2nd, these same people, especially in places like Bar uh, Barbados, Antigua, and St. Kitts, these same people on August 2nd had to go back and work for those same people who were enslaving them for little or nothing. So the, the justice denied, freedom denied is just, freedom delayed is justice denied is really a wonderful theme because I'm sitting here and thinking after 186 uh, years, a justice has been denied to the black community because of this, what I'm seeing as a con that the British government paid on the Africans, uh, played on the Africans and on their descendants. No, black people, the, the indices of black community under development, we talk about such as overrepresentation in arrest statistics, in, in um, being in jail, being over incarceration, racial profiling, health disparities, et cetera, et cetera. And the systemic racism that black people encounter in corporations, in education, in the justice system, in the political system, in media, and so forth, are um, all these in indices are all, are all a result of the racism that was used to justify slavery and the racism that was um, played out during slavery, the anti-black racism, and the racism that continued after slavery to this point in, in Canada, and in the entire British Empire where there was slavery. So I'm saying, Natasha, that justice is still denied and it is justice that we're still seeking right now. And um, the British Empire and also the American Empire, but maybe we'll just stick to the British, British and the French and the Dutch and the Swedes and the Germans and everyone else still owe black people a great deal because the playing field is still not level and black people are dying um, in, in the most wanton ways. As you know, we remember George Floyd as being one of the victims of such wanton brutality. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now if I could just say here that for myself, uh, growing up, my parents are from Jamaica and immigrated here, and I'm born here in Toronto. And I knew about the history of Emancipation Day as it relates to how it was marked in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. But I had no idea prior to researching and writing my book that Emancipation Day was celebrated in, in Canada. So when I had the opportunity to research and write the book, I really... Um, uncovered so much history in marking the day and recognizing the legislation, but so much more about community and political activism, um, uh, just, you know, a number of individuals who were, um, you know, who've done so many things in the community. And if you talked about, um, you know, the conditions after um, enslavement was abolished, you know, what people were able to do with, with so little in some instances and how community continue to grow and to, th to thrive over time. Um, that's something that for me, you know, in terms of what it means for me, it really means a, 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 an in-depth uh, history. It also means, as you as you mentioned, Ofua, as well, um, that the legislation it marked one aspect of uh, the end of, of enslavement, and it, and it started an ongoing movement for full freedom. And so when we were looking at the title, um, you know, for today and looking at where we are present day during the summer, we really see the, the, the continuum of, um, of exclusion, of the disparities, of the fact that full freedom was denied, uh, you know, effective August 2nd, 1834, as you talked about some of the ongoing conditions and that 
that led to and, and continues to lead to, um, you know, just rampant injustices that Black communities in, in Canada, but also in the United States and other parts of the world continue to face. And so for me, that is, um, you know, that is something that it, it uh, reminds me of, or it pushes me to, to think about how this is ongoing and how there is a lot more work to do um, as part of the words that uh, I, I read earlier from John Lewis. Carolyn, what did August 1st mean for your ancestors or how do you connect to the history of Emancipation Day? Well, it, you're all very difficult acts to follow. However, <laughs> I, I, I want to bring something to the table that springs off both something that Apua talked about and that you talked about, Natasha. Um, the July 31st, 1838 was a very significant date that at midnight that night, the apprenticeship system in the British Caribbean ended and people actually were emancipated between what Afua was mentioning um, that uh, the day after Emancipation Day, a day after August 1st, 1834, everybody had to go back to work for 40 hours or 45, depending on what island people were on, for the people they had previously been enslaved by. And they had to do that until August 1st, 1838. So my interest in all of the, my historical interest in transnationalism relates to how African Americans and African Canadians and African Caribbean people related to one another over issues of things like Emancipation Day and what it meant in the context of the politics of their time. The people in 1834 in North America were very well aware that justice had been denied and freedom had been denied to the people in the British Caribbean. So there were, so while there were commemorative events for Emancipation Day in 1834 in New York and Boston, for instance, they were relatively small events and people talked about the fact that people were not really free in the British Caribbean. There was a landmark event, which was August 1st, 1834, but it didn't mean what it should have. And so a lot of the American celebrations for emancipation in the British West, in, in the West Indies, and they were held in American cities and towns, particularly in the Great Lakes District. A lot of those celebrations did not really come into full form till after 1838 or even 1840. And they were commemorated right up until the time of the Civil War and in some places right through the 1920s and 30s, like in Adrian, Michigan. So people were very well aware of that freedom, the ju justice delayed and freedom denied. And I think it's very interesting that both Canadian and American people of the day spoke to this issue. There's another piece of the Emancipation Day commemorations and celebrations that was very important because Northern, the North part of the United States and Canadian, African Canadians, and also white abolitionists as well, worked together in tandem using Emancipation Day celebrations as a springboard to demand freedom for the enslaved and the Southern United States. And I can go on about that at some length, I'll talk later too, but I wanted to say that this was a piece of, the Emancipation Day was not only celebratory, it was resistant, profoundly resistant, and it continued to be so, right through the, the Civil War. Thank you, Charlie. Let's move on to our next question. Just a reminder to mute um, panelists when you're uh, not speaking. So our second question, winter's emancipation celebrations were often described as the greatest freedom show on earth, but they were much more than a show. What was the deeper meaning to the African Canadian community in the Windsor and other parts in the Windsor area and other parts of the province and country? And I'll turn it over first to Irene to respond to this question. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of people that are around us today, elders of both European and African descent here in Windsor and Essex County in southwestern Ontario, still refer to emancipation celebrations in terms of the parades and the midways and the talent shows and the Miss Sepia contest and the amazing food and just all of the amazing music. Um, it was such a, a time of joy every year, but it was a lot deeper than that. It was a time for families to come together. It really revealed the uh, nature of our borderlands communities that there were so many 
people who had been uh, Underground Railroad descendant uh, family members who were on both sides of the border residing in uh, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, New York State, and other places who would return at that time to really uh, join with families here in Canada, but also to commemorate the bravery and the determination of the ancestors who made it here after emancipation. And it was also a time for, for real social activism and a focus on, uh, on Black excellence and Black uh, equity issues uh, through a transnational lens. So you had a lot of meetings and discussions and speeches and uh, conversations between leaders from the African Canadian community and the African American community. And that was very much a part of emancipation in Windsor as well. So it was a lot more than a big party, although the party is what everyone tends to remember. It was a time for people to be inspired, to figure out how to engage in one another's struggles, to see the commonalities in their struggles, to look at uh, what uh, people of African descent in this region, in the American Midwest and Southwestern Ontario could do to support the struggles of African descended people in the American South, for example and also to, to shine a, a, a light on what was going on here in terms of segregation and discrimination and to galvanize support for those endeavors that were taking place, be it through the, uh, the Windsor Interracial Council or Windsor Council on Group, Group Relations, through the National Unity Association or other uh, important organizations that were doing really critical work across uh, Ontario, if not the rest of Canada. So it was a, a really important time for discussion, conversation. When I look back at uh, some of the leaders that were part of this, uh, obviously we recognized in Windsor a lot of uh, African Canadian leaders, but it's really critical to point out that people like uh, Mary McLeod Bethune were here for those celebrations, Martin Luther King was here, uh, Adam Clayton Powell was here, uh, people of that nature, of that stature, and Fred Shovelsworth and so on. So um, it was really a, a critical time for a cross-border transnational conversation about uh, the issues affecting people of the African diaspora. And, and I think in that way, it was well ahead of its time uh, to some degree and, and something that, that we uh, continue to focus on in terms of emancipation celebrations today is not just a party or a celebration, but Figuring out, figuring out how to advance the conversation about what uh, what people of African descent need in this country and what will move us forward. Yes, and the the, the phrase "the greatest freedom show on earth" really spoke to um, the magnitude of the event. It went on for two and three days, and thousands of people um, would come together from all parts of. Um, uh, in Ontario, and as Irene mentioned, in the United States as well. Um, and that was led by uh, Walter Perry. Um, and the, and what was the, the, the name of the, sorry, the, the organization for Irene? Yeah, it was the British American Association of Colored Brother, Brethren, which is a beautiful uh, statement about uh, how they perceive themselves from the British North America side and the American side people of African descent coming together to celebrate this important day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, thank you. Carolyn, um, I think if you could uh, respond to this question as well, I know you had started a piece in your previous response. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, one of the things that I looked at when preparing for this, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, one of the things I looked at in preparing for this was something I've been studying for some time, and that is the joint activities of the linked by faith, by blood, by common cause, um, African-American and African-Canadian communities on either side of what my friend Afua Cooper calls the fluid frontier, the watery border that divides um, mostly Ontario from, and, and of course Quebec, from the United States. And the fact that Emancipation Day was celebrated between those communities, the Rochester community would come to Toronto during Emancipation Day to celebrate together. The Buffalo, people from Buffalo would come across and they would celebrate together. Um, people from Detroit would go to Shrewsbury, which is a very small town, for instance, where they had a, a wonderful Emancipation Day celebration uh, right on, on Lake Erie. 
and they would continue those celebrations. The, there was this binationalism, and it had to do with promoting anti-slavery. It had to do with demanding the abolition of slavery in the United States. In addition to the celebrations, the family reunions, all the wonderful things that were very celebratory. Um, if you let, allow me to, uh, if, may I read one little bit, which is actually a direct quotation of what it was like to be in Toronto for Emancipation Day. This is about 1850. It's um, Canada's, uh, the first Canadian-born African-Canadian doctor. His name was Anderson Rufin Abbott. And he was recalling an event that happened when he was about 13. Um, this is in Toronto. He said, they provided a banquet which was held under a pavilion erected on a vacant lot running from Elizabeth Street to Sayre Street. That's uh, very close to City Hall in Toronto, opposite Osgoode Hall, which was then a barracks for the 92nd West Indian Regiment. The procession was headed by the red band of the regiment. The tallest man in this regiment was a black man, a drummer known as Black Charlie. Um, the procession carried a Union Jack, he's Trinidadian by the way, I looked him up, um, carried a Union Jack and a blue silk banner on which was inscribed gilt letters, the Abolition Society organized in 1833. The mayor of the city, Mr. Metcalf, made a speech on this occasion followed by several other speeches of prominent citizens. These celebrations were carried on yearly and with much enthusiasm. And they were always included a service at the Anglican Cathedral at, at what is now St. James Cathedral in Toronto. But if you don't mind me taking one more minute, might I do that? I'd like to speak to the transnationalism that happened with, do, or do you want me to do that later? But you can go right ahead. Okay, um, there's one person who really personifies a lot of this for me, and his name is Madison Lightfoot. Uh, Madison Lightfoot was involved in the rescue of Thornton and Lucy Blackburn in the Blackburn riots of 1833, which is how I first learned about him. He was originally a Virginian and had been in, De in, in Detroit since 1831. What a remarkable man, a completely transnational African-American man who was a community leader, he was a minister, he was a cook. He was a anti-slavery activist. He helped organize the Detroit Vigilant Committee to protect people from being kidnapped by slave catchers and taken to the South to be sold. He actually became a minister and every Sunday went across the river from his home in Detroit to Sandwich, which is now part of Windsor, where he was the minister at what is now the Sandwich Baptist Church when it was built. And that was in 1851 and it's now a National Historic Site. But he spent every Emancipation Day as either a president of or a guest speaker at an Emancipation Day celebration, mostly in Canada. And uh, he went back and forth right through 1880. He was the secretary for the Amherstburg Baptist Association, which joined the churches of Michigan with some churches in southwestern and southern Ontario. So he was invited for that reason. But he was also a great speaker. And he was the president often of the events. Um, uh, there was a joint celebration, for instance, this would be interesting to you, Irene, in Chatham, Windsor, in Detroit. They all came together at Colonel Prince's property outside of Sandwich, and he spoke as the president of the day. Um, in 1880, the Windsor Emancipation Day had a special tribute to lament his death because he passed away. That combined activism and celebration Mm -hmm. yes. yes yes yeah so some of those key themes as you talked about you know the deeper meaning of emancipation day uh celebration resistance family community and activism i wanted to continue to pick up on the thread around the transnational aspect of emancipation day celebrations um and in this third question we say african canadians and african americans would cross a fluid border, as you um, mentioned, and mark the occasion. And Caribbean immigrants and visitors contributed to how Emancipation Day has been celebrated in Canada. Um, and so I'd like to turn now to uh, Jean, to, to, uh, and then followed by Afua, to talk a bit about um, the transnational aspect of Emancipation Day celebrations. Jean? As we come as, we, as immigrants to Canada, as uh, we begin to 
uh, find ourselves um, and find our place in the society that we brought with us those traditions and those cultural things that we were used to. And so the issue of getting together with, um, with activists and, uh, and those who were on the ground for the number of years, uh, doing the work, calling, making the calls, um, integrating, um, the, the issues and from both sides of the border, uh, the communities that were moving. And we had a lot of movements of communities. A lot of, uh, the African Canadians from Atlantic Canada were moving into urban centers like Toronto. Um, a number of, um, of, uh, people were moving across the border before we had all these strict, res um, this restrictions about crossing the border that, um, there were many, many exchanges. And I tell you that activists and historians argue and continue to argue that before we can make any change or talk about any freedom in our country and see some of the things that we need to do, we need to know our history. Canadians must first accept, accept the fact that systemic um, racism exists, that a lot of we have a tarnished history in so many ways, um, and that those uh, permanent uh, structures, those inequities that were built into the system, we have to more or less deal with those. And so it's almost like a work in progress, this march towards freedom, this march towards equality and justice for all. And so those who join us coming from um, Commonwealth and colonial um, backgrounds uh, need to recognize that until the society recognizes that history and learn about that history and know about that history, then again, we play into the justice um, uh, denied. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jean. Afua. Yes, I am. Um, thank you. I it, it it's really a, a, a big international story, just like the Underground Railroad story, which is a, a transnational, cross border, but also international. And I wanna uh, you wanted uh, Jean and I to look at this connection between the Canadian, the American and the Caribbean. And I think this is exemplified in the Emancipation Day uh, picnic that um, happened in the 20th century. So I'm just gonna read uh, something here and then I have a short letter I'm, I'm gonna read that exemplifies that, that connection. So we all know that B.J. Spencer Pitt, a lawyer, a black lawyer, from Grenada. Um, with uh, Caribbean. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Jean. I was going to say of Caribbean roots, but <laughs> uh, more specific, Grenada. Grenada. <laughs> In the 1920s, B.J. Spencer Pitt masterminded what became the Port Dalhousie, but in Ontario, uh, we say Dalhousie, the Port Dalhousie picnic or big picnic when Toronto's black community took the ferry across Lake Ontario to Port Dalhousie. Ontario, a resort town near St. Catharines. In its heyday, the big picnic drew upward of 6,000 to 8,000 people from Toronto, the Niagara region, and New York State. It was a major event on the calendar of the Black, Toronto, Black Torontonians for three decades. Emancipation Day celebrations have been held in August every year in some part of Ontario since 1834. The day is now commemorated in Amherstburg, Oinson, and Collingwood. It was re-established in Toronto in 1997. Of course, other cities also hold Emancipation Day. And that quote I'm taking from the book, um, Carlin uh, Smarts and Adrian Shad and I co-wrote called The Underground Railroad Next Stop Toronto. And talking about the big picnic, um, uh, the the how it brought families together in in celebration and resistance and also in love. Adrian Shad told me that her parents uh, met at the big picnic 
emancipation day picnic at Port Dalhousie and they eventually got married. So, and I'm sure there were many more love stories that came out of those picnics. But I wanna, I have a letter here and I'm reading from uh, my other computer um, that BJ Spencer Pitt wrote to the mayor of um, St. Catharines in uh, May 17th, 1938. He said, may it please his worship. We are again holding this year our annual picnic at Port Dalhousie on Thursday, the fourth day of August, 1938. This year for the first time in history, the Negro Convention sponsored by the Universal Negro Improvement Association convenes in the city of Toronto from the first to the 19th of August, the United Negro Improvement Association. That's the association that Marcus Garvey founded an international, he founded it in Jamaica and it spread all over the world, it spread all over Canada, um, it spread to uh, Nova Scotia, um, Sydney, Nova Scotia, if you may recall, well, you won't recall, in 1937, <laughs> Marcus Garvey made that famous speech, um, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery, which inspired Bob Marley to write with the redemption song. So B.J. Spencer Pitt is telling the mayor of St. Catharines that, hey, the, the UNIA is having their convention in Toronto from the 1st to the 19th of August. Think of that, over two weeks of deliberation and of conferencing. We have been successful in asking the convention committee to set aside Thursday, August 4th as a free day so that the convention delegates coming from different parts of the world people coming from different parts of the world will join with us or would join with us in our annual picnic. According to our arrangements, we are trying to have the President General give an address at Port Dalhousie at 3.30 p.m. I have been requested by my local organization to invite you, Mr. Mayor, to attend this meeting, and we would be very pleased if you would extend this civic welcome to the President General and the Convention's delegate at 3.30 on that day at the picnic. Thanking you for your kind cooperation and favor, um, very truly yours, B.J. Spencer Pitt, and he was president of the Toronto Division Universal Negro Improvement Association. So in addition to being a lawyer, he was a lawyer, one of the few black lawyers in, in Toronto, I might add. He was the president of the UNIA, he, which meant he was a, a Garveyite, a Pan-Africanist, and a community leader. So in this Port Dalhousie picnic, and I'm speaking from Halifax, so sometimes I'm going to say Dalhousie, um, you had all these different branches of the Black Diaspora meeting, meeting at this picnic, meeting, thinking together, deliberating, um, planning, um, loving, praying, feasting, resisting, fighting racism. And it's, um, and here, here, the figure of the Honorable, Honorable Marcus Garvey looms large. So talk about black internationalism. It's here in this Emancipation Day celebration, Natasha. Yes, and in my book, my book right here, talking about freedom, I do talk about Marcus Garvey being the guest speaker that year. And um, just quickly before we move on, uh, in, in knowing that the convention took place and trying to find some evidence um, of the fact that Marcus Garvey actually did speak, it took quite some time. But in going to the St. Catherine Standard newspaper, I believe it was, and and looking, um, his name is misspelled, um, which you know, which. Um, caused quite a bit of time for me to, to locate um, that, that article. But as you talk about here, um, you know, with, um, with the UNIA being responsible for organizing, so here they are in Toronto organizing for uh, the Port Dalhousie event for quite some time, over 20 years, almost 30 years, um, and, and, you know, looking at all of the, the, the people who were coming in at, at that time and a lot of their conversation, um, and while there was that celebration as well, uh, there was absolutely a lot of conversation about what was going on locally, what was going on in the country, in the province, but also internationally as it related to um, people of African descent. 
And so that brings us to our next question. And I'm just being mindful of the time that um, uh, it's because we want to have time for a couple of, of questions and uh, and Senator Wanda um, Thomas Bernard is to speak. Um, so there's always been an element of political activism intertwined in Emancipation Day commemorations. Indeed, political activism is at the core of the abolition of enslavement. Can you elaborate on the political and social actions that have been part of Emancipation Day throughout its history. So I think we talked about that quite a bit. I just wanted to share one quick example, and then I'm going to ask Irene to share um, one example uh, as it relates to just a specific um, a specific incident, a specific issue. The one that I wanted to share had to do with um, the Black community in Chatham in the 1890s. And when they got together to mark Emancipation Day in 1891, what they decided to do was they um, put forth a motion and decided that they would not march um, in the streets, they would not have a parade in celebration. Instead, they would march in protest against segregated schools. And this was something, an issue that the community continued to advocate um, to advocate for change. And so at that e Emancipation Day event, the, resol the resolution was passed and they marched in protest. And that also set up a huge campaign to push, to increase their um, activism around ending racially segregated schools in Chatham. And finally, in 1893, uh, the community was successful. So that was just one example that I wanted to share. Uh, and there were several others as well that I document in my book. Irene? Can you hear me? Yes. And if we can just okay, all great. mute. Um, if we're not equal, thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, there are so many examples of that from the Windsor Emancipation celebrations, but I mean, I really, I, I, I've always been fascinated by the uh, the change in tone that took place uh, between the time of the Second World War when uh, the organizers of the Windsor Emancipation celebrations, especially Walter Perry, are very aspirational and hopeful in their speech. They're talking about Black soldiers fighting uh, side by side with uh, white soldiers and the defense of Canada and uh, the defense of principles that we all believe in. And that post-war period when the language of the speeches and writings around emancipation in Windsor became a lot more insistent and a lot more, uh, uh, I would say, demanding, assertive about uh, the ongoing struggles that people perhaps weren't expecting to still be in place after the war. So you see a lot more interest in immediate answers to the problem of segregation in, in Windsor, Essex County and Southwestern Ontario. You see a lot more uh, demands for equal opportunities to employment. You see a lot more focusing on black excellence and sharing information about people who have achieved despite the odds who are the first in their various professions and asking why there are not more opportunities for people of African descent to uh, to be employed in those uh, professions and those workplaces. And really uh, drawing on the, the work and the efforts of the many uh, civil rights and human rights organizations that had sprung up, not only here in Windsor, but in the United States and in other parts of Ontario, and really building those bridges and making those connections in terms of uh, agitating for changes to happen. Referring very often to the valiant service of soldiers and sailors of African descent in the Second World War and asking for changes to reflect the commitment that they had shown to Canada and to freedom. So I think that those are very interesting examples that we see a lot in the literature and the speeches from uh, those emancipation celebrations in Windsor from the late 40s to the, to the mid 50s. And uh, I really enjoy reading those and I enjoy the intentionality around uh, referring to patriotism uh, displayed or demonstrated by, by uh, Blacks in the military and what was owed to us as a result. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So our last question, what does freedom mean to you? What needs to be done for freedom and justice to be realized for African Canadians? I'm just going to ask each panelist if you could um, share one key message um, in about a minute. And I'll start with Carolyn. 
I, I've been thinking about what the other pan, everybody else in this panel is saying, and I'm very honored to be here. I spoke in 2018 at Emancipation Day in Owen Sound, which is celebrating this year its 158th, although it will be a virtual one. The coming together of family, but also the coming together of con ideas, the coming together of ideas that had to do with equality and resistance to oppression and the resistance to racism that were conversations going on all day long in Emancipation Day in Owen Sound that, that year. That spoke to me in a way that I have difficulty expressing right now. My great grandmother was enslaved in Virginia and found freedom in Canada after the Civil War. And I don't know how I could possibly begin to understand what freedom meant to her, except to say that making Emancipation Day a national event in this country is essential so that other people can also share in that sense of freedom and also move the agenda forward to abolish systemic racism in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Jean, if I can ask you to share some words. Natasha, I'm so very pleased to have had the opportunity to sit with these historians to make sure that, uh, that those who walk away from this, uh, this webcast uh, would do a bit of digging and would do a little more, uh, be a little bit more reflective about our situation. I sense the urgency of now. I have been in this community for over 60 years and have seen so much. And I have experienced the aspirational, the demands, the marches, the conversations around the situation of people of African descent, the anti-black racism and all of this. I feel that we're in 2020, as we do this virtually and as we speak virtually, I think the time has come for the society and for everyone within the society to recognize this whole issue of that justice denied, of that freedom that has been delayed. And I think the theme, again, if it can resound with everyone, as you listen to this, freedom delayed is justice denied. And we could delineate all this stuff in the society that we need to fix. But it's so important that we use this urgency of now to do the fixing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jean. Afua. Uh, first, I, uh, I just wanna express my great pleasure at being a part of such an August panel. And I want to give a special thank you to Senator Wanda Thomas Bernard for her leadership activism in this um, in this regard, and her her team in Ottawa for uh, helping to host this, and to the Ontario Black History Society, and also to MP Jawari for um, take, taking up taking up the baton, so to speak. So a big thank you to all of you. I, uh, two examples of, you know, how Emancipation Day celebrations in Canada has touched my heart. And I, I go like Harlan to uh, the Owen Sound celebration. I've spoken at the Owen Sound celebration. I've been there just as a, 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 a observer or a participant or a celebrant and it always touches my heart. I, I just feel when I'm there, like when I'm at Buxton, when I'm in Windsor, that the ancestors are with me. It's really a deep spiritual feeling I get when I'm there. I love the, gene the genealogy because now this uh, Owen Sound um, folks are, have embarked on the genealogical project, which is just tremendous. I love that. I love the photographs. I love the cultural show. And I love going down to the Cairn um, it, it's just a special feeling. And I think I perhaps have tapped into the ancestral spirit for which I'm eternally grateful. In Toronto, um, Aita Sadu and, and Miguel, Miguel San Vicente, who are married to each other and they own the bookshop, a different book list, also started the 
the underground, the, the freedom train. And, and people actually take a real TTC train and they go from Union Station up to North York and there are crowds of people, celebrations. I don't think it will happen this year, um, speeches, spoken words, singing, and just a lot, a lot of love among people. So there are those two things that that touch my heart all the time. Um, how, what does freedom mean to me? Um, or how can we get this justice that has been denied for so long? We have to defeat white supremacy in this country and in the world. White supremacy is the reason that you know, we don't have black history being taught in schools, so our black children and other children don't know of the wonderful things that the ancestors have done or the struggles. Um, and it's because of that that we, uh, black people are so marginalized. We have this over incarceration in prison. All these things are as a direct result of white supremacy and white supremacy has to be defeated. It's like a chain that still ties the entire society. And be before full freedom can be realized for African people, white supremacy has to be defeated. Thank you. Um... Afua. Irene, if you can share your words. Wow. I want to thank you so much for moderating this panel. I want to thank the organizers. Um, it's very appreciated that you brought us all together at this historical moment. Um, I don't want to veer too much off the topic, but I want to say earlier last month, there was a lot of interest across the Canadian media in Juneteenth for the first time ever. There was a, a tremendous level of interest in this American uh, celebration of freedom. And it was really important to keep bringing people's attention back to our own emancipation here in Canada and to get people to understand that anti-Black racism, the legacy of slavery, all of those things are not just American issues or American problems. We have our own, uh, our own responsibility to uncover and explore and uh, reconcile with our own past here in Canada and our present. All of those stereotypes and beliefs that are held about us as African people and that we sometimes hold against ourselves. All of those uh, situations that arise from the, the legacy of slavery, be it overrepresentation in the criminal justice system, uh, inappropriate streaming in the educational system, um, overrepresentation in the child protective service system, all of those things that happen uh, are stereotypes that exist in the media, are underrepresentation on the political scene, despite the advances made by people like John, like Jean Augustine. So we need to address a lot of things. And I think that what we uphold and what we honor, celebrate, and value as a society says a lot about us. And Emancipation Day is something that should have uh, federal recognition so that we can address the sins of the past and look forward to the future. I mean, like the Sankofa bird of West African culture, we want to be able to move forward while looking at the past. We can let the past guide us. And I think that there is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous history to be celebrated here. It's something of which all Canadians can be proud. And there are a lot of lessons to be learned. So I'm very hopeful that we will achieve federal recognition for this day and that it will be something that we can uh, embed in the curriculum that we can use as inspiration to further develop the, the level of knowledge and awareness that Canadians have about black history and our contributions to this country and the steps forward that we need to take to, to solve our current problems, which all relate to the past. Everything is interconnected. So thank you again for having me as part of panel and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about Emancipation Day in particular. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Irene. I wanted to extend a thank you to our panelists, Honorable Jean Augustine, Dr. Afua Cooper, Dr. Carolyn Smarts Frost, Irene Omar Davis, um, where we just you know scratched the surface of an a conversation that we hope will be ongoing. Um, and I wanted to, you know, extend my appreciation uh, to the Owen Sound Emancipation Day Festival and our team at the Ontario Black History Society and the um, Society of uh, the Association of Social Workers for working with us to make this panel and this event happen. So thank you very much.
At this time, I wanted to introduce Senator uh, Dr. Wander Thomas Bernard, who is going to uh, close us out with a, uh, with a message. Actually, I am so moved by all that I've experienced this evening. And I, I, I'm going to choose not to speak at the moment. And I know that we likely have some audience uh, participation. So I, I'd like to defer to the audience if we could take even one or two questions. I know we were late starting because of technical difficulties. But if, if people are okay to stay and CASW, if it's okay for us to stay a bit longer, I wonder if we could take a few audience questions and then I'll very briefly wrap up. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and I will say that there will be more information on the Owen Sound Emancipation Festival website, including this slide here, six ways to celebrate the 186th Emancipation Day and more information about, um, and we'll share information about uh, the the bill that's going to be hopefully moving forward, um, the one that was introduced by MP Jawari. Uh, so with that, Alexandra, do we have a couple of questions that from the um, from the listeners that we could take? Absolutely, Natasha. I think Anne Marie may have sent you some in the chat function. Um, so, if, Natasha, if you just want to pop onto that chat function there, um, but I will give you one right now. Uh, so, while Natasha goes through the chat function and takes a moment to see what uh, questions we have from the audience. We do have a really incredible one, and that is how can individuals in you know civil society who work in organizations, how can they get involved in terms of ensuring that this Emancipation Day uh, bill goes forward? Yeah, so perhaps MP Jawari, if you could speak to that a bit and then maybe Senator Bernard, Thomas Bernard. Sure, um, I'll be very quite brief. Uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, unfortunately, I got cut off, but um, uh, my speech will be made available and um, you, um, you you could read that uh, at your own uh, pleasure. Um, I, I think um, continuous advocacy and um, is the key here. And we can do the advocacy in, in many fronts. Um, on the legislative side, I'm, I'm more now, after participating in this panel, I'm more than um, committed to make sure that um, this bill gets through. And thank you. Thank you for educating me and thank you for educating um, uh, uh, our, our Canadian, uh, those are who are who are participating. I think on the civil side, on the civil society side, I think we can play a role by making sure that um, our school curriculum gets updated. And I think we can do advocacy at the provincial and, and, and our, our truce, our school board, that we could make sure that um, and the the African Canadian history is fairly represented um, as a chapter in our in our history, and um, th those are the two that jumps right um, you know um, come to me quickly. But again, I think we need to um, continue uh, on both front on the legislative side as well as on the civil side and on the education side. And again, there are many events and just sharing the stories. I think we need to continue. Um, and making sure that we make every day um, until we receive full justice as an Emancipation Day. It doesn't have to be August 1st. It could be August 2nd, August 3rd, and every day in the 365 days until we get there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I'll just um, uh, extend on something that you said that ties into a question about um, how do we suggest schools incorporate Emancipation Day curriculum into schools? And I would just say here that as it relates to Black experiences and the Black presence, the 400-year presence of African people here in Canada, there is not one specific expectation that students in Ontario have to learn about, um, about this history. 
in the Ontario Social Studies History and Geography curriculum. And that is something that needs to change. That um, ongoing exclusion is a form of systemic exclusion and systemic racism. And so that is something that needs to change. And so the stories um, of Emancipation Day, the stories of communities, the stories of activism, the stories of, of, of individuals um, need to be woven intricately throughout the curriculum at every grade. Um, and, you know, I know that individual teachers uh, do find that important and do do that. A lot of teachers do. Um, uh, but there also needs to be a systemic response uh, and correction to this ongoing exclusion. And so that's, that's something that I would I wanted to add as it relates to the point around um, around education. We have another question uh, for Dr. Fua Cooper. Since justice has continued to be denied, how would you suggest compensation or reparations should take shape for Black Canadians? Um, thank you. I would, um, in in a num in a number of ways, and in because in a number of ways, there's financial compensation, and there's also the de developmental model um, strategy, which is now being pursued by CARICOM, the the Caribbean community. Um, CARICOM is looking at a developmental model um, for slavery, uh, for colonization, and for racism. And that, that means many things. It's a, a fund for education, for health in many of our Black communities across North America. As you know, we in Canada, for example, the Black communities have um, there's disparity, health health disparities, for example, if we take that, the COVID-19 situation really points to that for us. So funding in our communities to, to um, raise the playing field or to level the playing field rather. Um, and that could be, that could go through community organizations, scholarships for students, um, um, you know, here in, in Nova Scotia, in Halifax, for example, in North Preston, we know that not, and other communities, not just North Preston, we know that not every uh, person has a title to the land that they're living on, even though the Nova Scotian government, maybe two years ago, um, committed, I think, $2 million to help Black uh, people who have been settled on the land for generations. Um, get titles to their land because without title to your land, as you know, the land can be taken away. You can't sell the property, et cetera, et cetera. So through a variety of what I'm going to call developmental, um, means, uh, people like Raymond Winbush have done calculations as to how much money is owed to the African diaspora community in Canada, United States and the Caribbean. And it comes into the tune of trillions of dollars. So a variety of ways which, um, Natasha, I could send you a link and you may be able to put it up on the website or something because it's really very involved, but uh, just to say those things. But you know, when I was growing up in Jamaica um, as, as a kid and you in the communities of East Kingston, and you would always hear the Rastafari people say that Queen Elizabeth or Jamaicans 20 million pounds. Didn't understand, but I, I heard that it was in the songs and so on. 20 million pounds. And when I went to high school, I, I was able to understand what the Rastafarians were talking about or what Rastas were talking about, because then I studied West Indian history. And you know that it wasn't Queen Elizabeth per se, I think it was William IV who was king at the time of emancipation, who gave the 20 million pounds to the former owners of enslaved Africans. But of course, Queen Elizabeth is descended from that line. So, you know, when Rastas were talking about that, she was queen. But it's this sense that um, uh, freedom has been delayed and justice has been denied and this sense of outrage on the part of the Rasta community that says, you know, they gave the money to the 
white people, after we slaved for them for close to 400 years, they gave us nothing. So they still owe us that 20 million pounds, right? Which, as I said earlier, translate to $7 billion. But I would say to the person who asked the question, there is a well-developed body of literature on the reparations movement, whether it's Caribbean or or United States or Brazil for that matter. And there's a, a, a lots of discussion happening now on the reparation questions for Canada, which of course is a very multifaceted discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Afua. A quick follow, I have one more question we'll take um, before we close. Um, and someone had wanted a follow up around the curriculum. Is there a plan to expand the African Canadian curriculum in Canada? So curriculum is um, covered under each province, ministries of education. And here in Ontario, as I mentioned, um, I, the state of um, the inclusion, the integration of black experiences are pretty much the same. I know Nova Scotia fared a bit better uh, in terms of uh, integration in the curriculum. Uh, and so that's something that we have to continue to lobby for, uh, that the, the Ministry of Education in their revision of the, the curriculum, that they, it, right, that it's mandated that some learning expectations be put in there. And as you had talked about, Afua, around the, the, the land, uh, there was a question here that came up around um, uh, navigating this tent, this, this, the relationships around land. How should the Canadian government navigate First Nations land claims for land that is currently occupied by the descendants of formerly enslaved Africans? And I'll, I, if I, I'll open it to if someone wants to um, reply. Ifua, did you want to? I am. Um, I would say I could reply, but I, I think maybe I should turn it over to Senator Thomas Bernard. I don't know one day if you want to answer that. No, you go ahead and then I'll wrap up. <laughs> Okay. All right. Very good. Um, yes. So there's a, it, it's a big question. And the thing is that we as African children, when we were brought here or children, the descendants of Africans who were brought here to North America, we were brought here in chains. It was not our wish or will to leave Africa. We were dragged here in chains by various colonial governments um, and they let us slave for them for at least four centuries as we know. We got nothing, our labor was stolen, our talents were stolen, our minds were stolen. And to this day you see our genius and our talents still being stolen and our labor for that matter. Slavery was generational, which means that your children, grandchildren down to the line forever um, would be enslaved also, because that's how the colonizers and the imperialists, that's how they set, set it up. So it, we were not, we weren't in a bargaining position to say, you know, we, we want to come to Canada or we want to go to Louisiana or whatever. And so if you take the case of the black loyalist who fought on the side of the British, the British colonial power, and then the American uh, colonists who revolted against Mother Britain, and then the um, United States became its own empire. And the Black Loyalists fought on the side of the British in exchange for their freedom. In exchange for my freedom, I fought your revolution, and I raised you new nations on both sides of the division, says Richard Pierpoint, a Black Loyalist from, from Ontario. And so if you, when the Black Loyalists went to Nova Scotia, for example, all that the British promised in um, most instances were denied to them. That's why 1100 took off and went to, to, um, to Sierra Leone because life was hell in Nova Scotia. The racism that they experienced was just, you know, you, you all know about that. And so until the British crown in this case, can come and sit at the table. And we're not even waiting to sit at the table with them. We're just gonna, you know, take our freedom. But that discussion, which is what we have been discussing the whole time here, right? They have to reckon with that history and they have to reckon with 
the African Canadian community and, and they have to show remorse. They have to say a wrong has been done to you people, right? Um, you know, in the same way that they had those discussions and continue to have, maybe not in the way the indigenous community wanted, but that is certainly out there as an item on the agenda. That's why we have the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation um, uh, uh, Tribunal and so forth. That discussion has taken place. That discussion has not taken place with the African Canadian people. Even as much as we understand and we see indigenous people as allies, and sometimes we share the same bloodline, and sometimes we share the same struggles, but that discussion has not taken place. If the British government want to say, okay, you all can go back to Africa, or you know Queen Elizabeth and her heirs and successors. We have to go back to Africa, and we, you know, of course, we're not just gonna listen to what they say, and they won't say that. But we have to have that discussion. It hasn't taken place. That's why reparations is so critical because under the umbrella of operate, uh, reparations, that we 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 will talk about that, and we will put out policy. We will put out ideas and suggestions and recommendations how that can happen. So the black people on mm -hmm. this continent are still denied, are still denied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Afua. Senator Thomas Bernard. I believe that the next session we hold will be on reparations. It's, it's clear to me that this conversation needs to continue. These conversations need to continue. What we have experienced tonight is what I'm calling an unanticipated benefit of COVID. Because if not for COVID, we would be holding events, Toronto, Owen Sound, maybe Burlington, Windsor, Chatham, Kent, wherever. We'd be holding the individual on-site celebrations for Emancipation Day. But because of COVID, we've been able to assemble this incredible panel. You've been able to give Canada, give Canadians a little bit of, of this history. And so I want to say thank you on behalf of, of my colleague uh, who's championing the motion in the House of Commons, MP, Majid Jahari, I thank you for taking the cause and moving it forward. When someone said to me uh, back in June, the, the, um, my bill died on the order paper. And my response was, but I didn't die. And this isn't going away. And so we're bringing back, the, the motion is coming forward. But for those of you who are watching and listening, let me say this, you don't have to wait for the House of Commons to pass a bill saying we nationally recognize Emancipation Day. You can do things in your own homes, in your own communities, in your own municipalities. You can lead the charge to recognize Emancipation Day in so many different ways. So we will post on our site some suggestions. You don't have to be constrained by those suggestions. Tonight we've heard a phenomenal, we've heard phenomenal historians talk about Emancipation Day, but also talk about how significant this is. The need to remember, the need to reflect, the need to honor the work of our ancestors by continuing that work today. That's the best way that we can honor our ancestors honor this that our elders made. When I think sometimes about, I think about our ancestors, I think about all that they did just to survive. And I think about where we are today, and I think about the voices that are protesting in the streets and that are saying the, the urgency for real sustainable food is now and recognizing Emancipation Day is just one, maybe just the tip of the iceberg of what needs to be done. Because truly, truly, 
freedom denied and justice delayed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Thank I want you, to, Senator. Um, I, knew, I knew he was going to be here. Come and say hello, Gavin. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Here's Gavin. <laughs> Uh, He's been <laughs> say what? Say hi. Just wait. Hi. Say so we hi. So uh, Natasha, <laughs> thank you for moderating the panel. Yeah. Oh, don't, don't, don't. Thank you. And I just I'll wanted to say that we do have your information here around six ways to celebrate um, the 186th Emancipation Day ritual fair. I also wanted to share quickly some events that are taking place to mark Emancipation Day. The Ontario Black History Society has a event on July 31st, which you can find more information on in our website and social media. Owen Sound is marking uh, 158th consecutive Emancipation Day celebrations um, virtually this year on August 1st at 11 a.m. There's also uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, who's also gone virtual. They're gonna be hosting a tour on August 1st and throughout the week next week, there will be uh, interviews each day uh, relating to the topic of Emancipation Day. So stay tuned for that as well. And on August 1st as well, there is a panel um, in Ham through, hosted by the ACCA in Hamilton uh, commemorating Emancipation Day. Uh, again, these events you can we will share on our, our social media outlets. And uh, Irene has, I think, one an, an event to share quickly. Unmute, unmute. Oh, shoot. Unmute. Can we, can there you go. Okay. Yes, you, yeah, we can, can hear you. you. Okay. So the Amherstburg Freedom Museum yes. is hosting a webinar on Facebook Live on uh, July 31st at 1 p.m. on the Amherstburg Freedom Museum Facebook page. And here in Windsor, something that gives me great joy, on August 1st at 1 p.m. there will be a citywide Black organizations march by the riverfront, starting at the Great Canadian Flagpole and winding up at City Hall Square to address ongoing issues of injustice and anti-Black racism and to give people in Windsor a chance to tell their personal stories of anti-Black racism. And I'm so excited about that because that's really what Emancipation Day is all about, moving forward in the march towards freedom. Thank you, Irene. So thank you to our viewing and listening audience, to the panelists, MP Jawari, uh, Senator Thomas Bernard, and uh, the Association of Social Workers for our wonderful evening. And everyone stay engaged and stay safe. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.